Okay. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's second webinar in this four-part series called Yellowstone Perspectives, hosted by the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. This series, along with some new museum exhibits, which will open over the next couple of years, commemorate the 150th birthday of Yellowstone, the world's first national park. My name is Diane Chalfont, and I'm a volunteer and board member of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum here in Livingston, Montana. Our museum is a tremendous resource for our community and so much of it can be accessed online. Besides the webinar programs, the Yellowstone Gateway Museum also offers a fascinating digital photo archives, online exhibits, and research services. If you're not currently a member, we encourage you to become a member of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum and explore more about the rich natural and cultural heritage of Park County, Montana. In a moment, I'll introduce the museum's curator, Karen Reinhardt, but first I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so that you'll know how to participate in tonight's event. At any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions of our presenter, Douglas McDonald. Your questions will be anonymous. To submit a question, just type your question in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And Karen and I will read the questions and we'll share them with our speaker. And as time allows, Doug will answer as many of the questions as he can after the presentation. We are recording this webinar and we will be uploading it to the Yellowstone Gateway Museum's YouTube channel after the event. And what's great about that is you'll be able to watch the program again on the YouTube channel or invite friends and colleagues to watch it as well. Um, you can also watch some of the other programs that we've recorded over the last couple of years. It's been a pretty fascinating um, couple of series at the museum. Finally, following the webinar, we'll have an opportunity to take a very short survey, and we do hope that you'll take this survey and help us to continue to improve this and other programs at the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. Uh, I'd like to now introduce the Yellowstone Gateway Museum's curator, Karen Reinhardt. Karen? Thank you, Diane, and thank you for all of your help with the series. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to remind you of our upcoming programs. Next Wednesday on April 20th, Lisa Morgan, U.S. Geological Survey Scientist Emeritus, presents The Dynamic Floor of Yellowstone Lake, The Last 14,000 Years of Hydrothermal Explosions, Venting, Doming, and Faulting. Lisa has worked in the park for 42 years, and will share very interesting findings about the largest high elevation lake that is above 7,000 feet in North America. The final program is April 27th, also Wednesday night, presented by Katie Shepard Christensen, editor of the Artist's Field Guide to Yellowstone. She collaborated with 50 local artists and writers who paired up to reveal new ways of understanding the park's key species using prose, poetry, and artwork. Artists Jenny Low Anchor and DJ House, and writers Elise Atchison and myself will also participate. And now to introduce tonight's speaker, archaeologist Douglas H. McDonald is a professor in the anthropology department at the University of Montana. He earned a BA in anthropology with honors from Brown University in 1991 and an MA in 1995. Doug earned a PhD from Washington State University in 1998. Since 2006, his research at U of M has focused on the Native American archaeology of Montana, Wyoming, and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. In 2018, the University of Washington Press published Before Yellowstone, Native American Archaeology in the National Park. This book provides an overview of the last 11,000 years of Native American use of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And much of the research in his book was highlighted in a January 2021 cover article in Smithsonian Magazine. The Yellowstone Archaeology Project has also provided research for the completion of more than 15 graduate student projects, as well as more than 20 published articles and book chapters, including one recently published in American Antiquity, the major journal of American archaeology. McDonald's other published books include Montana Before History, published in 2012 by Monta Mountain Press, Yellowstone Archaeology and Lithics in the West. Please welcome Douglas McDonald. Thank you, Karen, for that introduction. And thanks for having me here um, 
for your for your talk series. I I appreciate it. And, and we, as we were talking about before this, I'm glad I didn't have to make the trip in that snowstorm um, the last couple of days. And so happy to be here. And uh, I always enjoy going to Livingston, though. So I'll, I'll take a rain check next time. So I, I guess I'll just launch into my talk and I'll pull up my PowerPoint and um, do the share screen thing. Yeah. Are you guys seeing that? No, not yet. Not yet. There, it's coming along now. Okay, sorry about that. You see it now? Yeah, you might it's, be able to maximize um, your. You might be able to maximize your screen. Not sure. Um, I didn't, I had it started in the middle. <laughs> okay, there you go. All Great. right, you see it? Yep. All right. And so the title of this talk is going to be Before Yellowstone Archaeology in the First National Park, and it's going to be uh, covering a lot of different topics, mainly focused on the archaeology that the University of Montana has been conducting in Yellowstone National Park in cooperation with the uh, Cultural Resources Group there. Uh, in, in Yellowstone National Park. Um, so I think you all know where you guys are in terms of the Livingston and the Yellowstone Gateway Museum there in Living, Livingston. I'm, I'm based in Missoula, so I'm at the University of Montana where I'm a professor. So I always like to say that I'm not an employee of Yellowstone National Park. So I don't, I don't speak for Yellowstone National Park. I, I can only speak for myself and, um, uh, and express my own, my own views on the Native American history of Yellowstone. So the I think the reason that a lot of you have learned about Yellowstone, hopefully, is because you've read the book that came out in 2018 before Yellowstone. Um, and I, I really enjoyed putting that together. And again, it's it's not just based on, on my research, but it's based on the many, many years of research that archaeologists and other anthropologists have been working in Yellowstone since really the 1950s. Um, and so it's a compilation of all that research organized into chapters that are uh, really for lay people and, and not really a, a meant to be a, a book for scholars or academics or anything like that. It's, it's really intended for um, really students that here at the University of Montana that might never have known anything about not just archeology span but also Yellowstone National Park. And then, so the book kind of weaves that story about Native Americans and their history in Yellowstone. A lot of the research is based on our own work in Yellowstone National Park. It's a project that we've called the MIAP or the Montana Yellowstone Archaeological Project and that started um, through some meetings with the former park archaeologist Ann Johnson and the former uh, another former archaeologist in Yellowstone Elaine Hale. We had a meeting in the winter of 2006 in, in Gardner and, and speculated about um, potential projects that as a new faculty member at the University of Montana, I was exploring opportunities and uh, um, both Elaine and Anne, Elaine Hale and Ann Johnson were uh, graduates of the University of Montana, so they were really supportive. And so we started our first project in the Gardner Basin area, north of where the Heritage and Research Center is now. That was our first project. So that was 2007 and we're keeping going. We've been uh, working all the way through that time every year. And this will be, our, I think, our 16th or 17th year in 2022. Um, the goal of the MIAP or the Montana Yellowstone Archaeological Project is really for me is to train our students. So a lot of our students are going to be involved in cultural resource management. Uh, they, they're not really getting into archaeology to become faculty members or professors uh, or even academics per se. Most, most of our students want to work for the National Park Service. They want to work for the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management. Um, consulting companies within the business uh, that we call cultural resource management. And there's tremendous opportunities uh, for archeologists within cultural resource management. And um, a lot of our students who, who graduate with degrees 
go on to have really great careers in archaeology. So if you have kids that are interested in archaeology, there really are a lot of opportunities out there for them to succeed and, and to be a professional archaeologist. It's not um, it's not something that they should shy away from. There really are some good opportunities. So we are there to train our students, and that's the main goal for me. Um, we also provide information to Yellowstone about important archaeological sites that we, we find that they bring us in to do projects, and we'll tell them where these sites are that they've asked us to survey particular areas. We'll find sites, and we'll uh, those that, that site location information and information about the importance of the sites help them uh, to protect them. So protecting archaeological sites, I think, is probably the priority for the Yellowstone Park archaeologists. So it's our job to help them with that. Um, for me, a lot of our research, a lot of our um, archaeology in Yellowstone also gets worked into uh, my research. So of course, the Before Yellowstone book is an example of that. The, the article that um, was mentioned at the beginning of this in my introduction that we just published a couple of years ago uh, about some of our research that I'll talk about today. Uh, those are all important for me as an academic working at the University of Montana. I have to do that sort of stuff to, to, um, to, to keep my job. And so that's, that's important for me. It, it's important to advance the research too in terms of just disseminating information about the Native American history uh, of Yellowstone National Park. And so that's where my research comes in is to, is to understand that Native American prehistory uh, as well as even up into the historic period. A lot of you might not have read the Before Yellowstone book, but maybe you encountered the article that was in the Smithsonian uh, that came out uh, in 2021 in January, so more, a little more than a year ago now. Uh, and uh, you know that's really heightened the interest in, in Yellowstone archaeology and, and the Native American history. I think it's even becoming more highlighted this year because it's the 150th anniversary in Yellowstone, and it's been really great to see Yellowstone's response to the 150th anniversary and they're uh, incorporating a lot of Native American cultural historical events in, into the um, 150th anniversary. So it's been great to see. So I'm an archeologist and archeology span is within the Department of Anthropology at the University of Montana. And that's a traditional way that archeology span is organized throughout the United States. Uh, archeology span is almost always within a department of anthropology. Anthropology is the study of people. And so anthropologists do a lot of different things within my own department here at the University of Montana. We have uh, faculty members that study human language, human biology and DNA, um, as, as well as uh, contemporary modern uh, people. So anthropologists, me as an archeologist wanna understand people in the past, anthropology tries to prevent, present a really holistic view of people. And, and that's what interested me to become an anthropologist is that I've always been interested in why people tick, what makes people tick, why people do what they do, that sort of thing. And so um, archeology has facilitated that interest for me. Uh, and so within Yellowstone, we do a lot of different types of archeology. span I would say most of the work that we do is, is just identifying archeological span sites. So that includes things like archeological span survey, just going out and looking in particular areas that are of interest to Yellowstone and identifying the locations of archeological span sites. Um, once we find a site, we might, we might actually go in and do some different types of uh, archeology, span which might include fancy ways of mapping sites, uh, even including some subsurface imaging. Here's a colleague of mine, Professor Steve Shera from the University of Montana using some subsurface ground penetrating radar at Yellowstone Lake. Uh, we also do uh, excavations occasionally when, um, when Yellowstone needs to determine uh, the importance of an archeological site for listing on the National Register. So we've worked all over the park and again, all kinds of different types of archeology. span I, I like to show pictures of the work we did at Yellowstone Lake because that was such a fun project back in 2009, 10, 11, 12, those, those years, maybe about 10 years ago or so now, we, we did a great project finishing all the archeological um, work around Yellowstone Lake. So that's actually one location in Yellowstone that's been really, really well documented. And we know the locations of all the important archeological sites around the shoreline uh, of Yellowstone Lake. We've done a lot of work in river valleys. This is the picture in the, um, 
uh, the headwaters of the Lewis River. I was going to say Lamar River, but we've we've also worked there. But this is the up near uh, the Lewis River Falls in that beautiful canyon. Um, the sky uh, done it. It's a beautiful hike up in the Gallatin Mountains, and I'll speak a little bit uh, about that a little more later. And again, this is just another photo of some of our work in Yellowstone National Park uh, in the backcountry areas uh, that we surveyed around the shore of Yellowstone Lake. And it's a, I always like to show this picture because it, uh, it shows the two canoes, but I'll tell you what, that red canoe handles the Yellowstone Lake a lot better than the green canoe. And I don't think any of my students wanted to ride in that green canoe. They, we almost submerged it a couple different times. It just doesn't handle well <laughs> on lakes. It is definitely a river, a river canoe. Wildlife's always a, a wonderful part of our work. And every time I go to Yellowstone, I'm always excited to see the wildlife, always excited to see the geological features and thermal features and things like that. And um, but obviously, as an archaeologist working in, in the backcountry, I have to be really careful always looking and watching the backs of myself and my students and making sure we're carrying bear spray and things like that. So uh, bear safety is a really, really important thing for us. Even, even in some of the front country areas, we've worked in areas like Fishing Bridge. I mean, there's bears all over that place. So it's not like um, we can never really be too cautious in, in being bear aware. Um, and we've done a lot of different archaeological sites uh, in the Yellowstone River Valley. This was one of our first projects up north of the Heritage Research Center, and I'll, I'll speak about that a little bit later as well. And so one of the, one of the interesting things that I've learned in my, in my years of doing archaeology in, in Yellowstone is that the national park system sometimes has this uh, dichotomy between cultural and natural parks. And I think for some, um, as an organizational principle, it makes sense because you do have some places like Yellowstone, like Yosemite, like Glacier, which are really focused on their, their wonderful natural beauty, Zion, you know, those beautiful natural landscapes. But um, it's been a little bit harder to incorporate those natural parks and incorporate the cultural aspects in, of, for example, Native American history or even European American history into those natural parks. Whereas other places like Gettysburg National Park, those are built around history and human history in particular. So it's much easier for those sorts of parts to disseminate the cultural history, but it's been exciting to see Yellowstone embracing their uh, Native American heritage uh, over the last several years um, and, and starting to bring more displays and roadside information and uh, just information about Native American history. So I think that's gonna really explode this summer during the 150th uh, anniversary of the park is really disseminating a lot more information about the Native American history. So what I'm going to do is start um, on a little tour of Yellowstone and just talk about some of the archaeology we've done in Yellowstone National Park. And um, since you're in Livingston, I probably should have started this in Gardner, but I'm actually going to start it over in West Yellowstone, uh, over on the western uh, entrance of Yellowstone National Park. So this uh, gives you a little bit of an overview of where Yellowstone National Park is. Uh, the, on the left, that left map shows you the red boundary of Yellowstone. Um, it shows you the yellow boundary of what is the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which of, of course incorporates Livingston and West Yellowstone. Um, and then on the right in that map, it shows you some of the places that I'll talk about as we're going to wind our way through the park and just give you sort of a cultural tour of some of the important Native American um, historical places that, that we've studied and other people have studied uh, in, in Yellowstone National Park. So each one of those stars we're going to start in West Yellowstone, then we're going to work clockwise around that um, the, the Grand Loop Road, and we're going to point at some of those stars as, and talk about some of the archaeology that we've done. Uh, so there are 27 associated Native American tribes that Yellowstone National Park consults with. Again, I am not an employee, so I do no Native American consultation. I leave that up to the federal archaeologist because it's a it's a government to government. Uh, consultation. So the government of the United States through the National Park Service consult about important issues to Native American tribes, which are their own governmental entities. So there's 27 tribes that like to be consulted on the important cultural resource issues uh, and the park cultural resource personnel. Tobin Roop is the cultural resource manager. Um, 
uh, Beth Hortons, the park archaeologist, uh, and and all their whole team, uh, Tom James as the Yellowstone Park Highways archaeologist. They all handle the government to government uh, cultural resources consultation. All right, so let's enter from the west. So we're going to be, uh, as you can see, there's a little inset map there that'll show you where we are. If you had entered the park maybe a month ago, this is how you would have done it. <laughs> uh, the snow is melting fast, even though we got that dump yesterday, it, uh, a lot of it's gone. And um, I was lucky enough to head down to West Yellowstone maybe six weeks ago and have a really wonderful weekend of cross country skiing there in West Yellowstone. It's a great place to spend time in the winter. Uh, one of the ways to get into the park in the winter time is through snow coaches. In this case, I was in a snow coach with my family, I don't know, maybe, 12 years ago now, I think that I took them down there and we were fortunate enough to ride through the park. A lot of snowmobiles have their permits to get into the park that way as well. Obviously, we would never be doing archaeology at this time of year, um, but it's uh, for certain that, uh, you know, Native Americans were probably in and out of the park, even, even in, in the colder, colder weather. This is a photograph. This particular day when we were running down out to Old Faithful from West Yellowstone, it was 20 below. It was just one of those cold Montana, West Yellowstone days. And um, these bison were not, not afraid of that water. It was probably actually warmer than the air temperature. Um, that leads you back out into uh, near that spot. There's a, a place called the Cougar Creek Obsidian Source. Uh, uh, this is a great little small, small little obsidian source. And I, I like to show this one just because it is so small. And I think a lot, when a lot of people think of obsidian, as a really important stone that Native Americans used and collected within Yellowstone National Park, they often think about um, obsidian cliff, but there's lots of obsidian. There's probably 20 different obsidian sources, if not more, in Yellowstone National Park. And I just want to reiterate that it is illegal to collect obsidian in the park. So um, I encourage people to take pictures um, and not take specimens of the obsidian, especially at places like Obsidian Cliff, which is a National Historic Landmark. Uh, it is very illegal and, and you would at least get a ticket and probably arrested under the Archaeological Resource Protection Act if you took obsidian from, from arch any archaeological site, but even these obsidian quarries that I'm going to talk about today, I always like to throw that in there as a little, a little caveat just to make sure you're all aware of that. <laughs> you can't plead ignorance now. All right, so obsidian is really important. Native Americans collected it to make their stone tools. And uh, the Cougar Creek Obsidian Source is, is one of those spots, but it's really small. It's only a few acres. It's really just one little tiny spot on the landscape, but Native Americans found it. And that's the amazing thing is that all these, it's not surprising that Native Americans found Obsidian Cliff. It's huge, right? It's a really massive obsidian quarry uh, with lots and lots of obsidian. What, what is amazing is that all these little ones have been found and every one that I've ever found in Yellowstone shows evidence of Native American use. And so what that tells me is that every nook and cranny in Yellowstone National Park was used by Native Americans. If, if they're finding some of these really, really backwoodsy locations of, of this obsidian, it just tells me that they've seen it all. They were there for 11,000 years. Native Americans were in and out of Yellowstone, living there, uh, incorporating the entire landscape into their, their daily lives. Um, just some more pictures of that Cougar Creek obsidian source. So there are a few pits and trenches at obsidian uh, at Cougar Creek, but they're nothing in comparison to obsidian cliff. Uh, this is a trench feature. So Native Americans weren't just casually going around collecting obsidian, they were actually digging trenches and pits to get to the high quality obsidian to make their stone tools. Uh, but as you work uh, a little bit further to the east and north on the Grand Loop Road, uh, you'll get uh, past the area where the Norris Geyser Basin is. Maybe a few miles north of the Norris Geyser Basin, you'll encounter a roadside um, display that's called Obsidian Cliff. And they've modernized that display. That's one of the great things they've done recently as part of, part of the highway upgrade in that area is that they updated the uh, highway display associated with the Obsidian Cliff National Historic Landmark. So Obsidian Cliffs have been used by Native Americans for 11,000, 12,000 years. It's a really important place uh, to collect obsidian. It looks like it was used by multiple different tribes coming from the north, say the Blackfeet, the, uh, coming from the west, the Nez Perce coming from the south and east, the different bands of the Shoshone, uh, the Crow from the, the uh, east, northeast, 
uh, among many other tribes, uh, it was really well known as a, as a great place to find obsidian. And a lot of what people ask me is, you know, since it was such an important special location for obsidian, was it owned or operated by any one of those tribes? And if so, was it were there wars or was there fighting over it? And we've never found any evidence that there was any kind of violence associated with the, you know, these days, think about it. When we, when we think about natural resources, we fight over those natural resources, right? <laughs> I mean, there's whole wars fought over oil and, and other important minerals. Um, that doesn't look like it was the case for Obsidian Cliff. Um, remember that these are hunter-gatherer peoples. Um, they're living in fairly comparatively small populations to what, what we uh, have today. Uh, and given the massive uh, size of Obsidian Cliff, it really does look like there was enough obsidian to go around in the sense that there didn't need to be any ownership associated with it. Now, I will say that those different groups of hunter-gatherer peoples, those Native American tribes coming from different directions, probably had different entry points and different access points and different areas that they preferred, probably on their directionality of entry um, in, into Obsidian Cliff. Now, one of the really cool things about Obsidian Cliff is that we know it was a really important type of obsidian that was traded and collected by Native Americans across the United States. It's been found as far east as places like Ohio and Michigan, as far, as, as far south as the Gulf Coast, um, and as far north up into uh, the, the Great Lakes region. And so obviously, and even more so, was the dominant type of stone material used by Native Americans for thousands of years in, in Montana and, and Wyoming. It just really did dominate it. I will say, once you get over to Idaho, there was another super obsidian quarry called Bear Gulch, which is on the Montana-Idaho border uh, in the Centennial Range. That is actually twice as big as Obsidian Cliff. And, and once you get into Idaho, that obsidian source really becomes dominant. Now, the cool thing in this, this illustration by Eric Carlson, it's in the Before Yellowstone book, does a great job of showing, and this photograph provided by Richard Hughes of these two women holding massive bifaces, ceremonial bifaces made from obsidian cliff obsidian. Now, we know that about 80% of the obsidian found in the Ohio Hopewell mounds, um, there's lots of obsidian found there and it's acquired through trade and maybe even through direct travel by some groups from Ohio hunter-gatherers 2000 years ago to collect the obsidian. That's an open debate among us archeologists. Um, but some of that obsidian, most of it was from obsidian cliff, but some of it was from that Bear Gulch source as well. And Native Americans collected it. They were trading it across the country in this Hopewell interaction sphere, this trade network. Um, and there's even some reason to believe that uh, Native Americans from Ohio might have made that trip themselves to collect the obsidian directly, which is pretty exciting. If they did that 2000 years ago, they would have been uh, following much the same route that Lewis and Clark did um, in the early 19th century. Um, we've done some archaeological survey around the edges of, of Obsidian Cliff, and it's just a, an ocean of obsidian. There's just cobbles and cobbles of obsidian there. And again, it is totally illegal to collect it. Um, uh, so, you know, obviously you can uh, go into the roadside display. It's illegal to be up on top of Obsidian Cliff these days. It's very dangerous once you're up there. Um, so I'd say just, you know, keep to that roadside display. It's uh, maybe someday in the future, they'll have a trail which provides some access to Obsidian Cliff itself. But these days, the only access, the only legal access is, is at that um, Obsidian Cliff pull-off between Norris and Mammoth. Um, so that trade was part of one of the exotic, one of the exotic materials traded in that Hopewell interaction sphere. So that existed about 2000 years ago. And those Hopewell people living in the Mississippi Valley, the Ohio Valley, uh, a bit up even into the Missouri Valley and up into the Great Lakes region, uh, buried their important people in mounds. They had ceremonies and religions associated with the mounds, and they liked to have exotic goods to be buried with those important people, with their family members in, in those graves. And so obsidian became an important part of that ritualistic burial within the mounds, as in addition to like shark teeth from the Atlantic Ocean, marine shells from the Gulf of Mexico, copper from the Great Lakes, um, silver from the upper Midwest, quartz and mica and copper as other important glittery minerals that shined and, and were important for the ceremonial purposes of the Hopewell. So when we find quarries in places like Yellowstone and Montana and Wyoming, even outside of the park, most of the really intensive active quarrying for that rock 
was during this time period. It was a really intensive time where people were going out of their way to find stone um, to trade, but also to hunt bison because bison hunting was escalating at a, at a massive rate. So when you see these big bison jumps in some places of Montana, like Madison Buffalo Jump near Three Forks or, or Wapkachugan up by Haver or any of those big bison jumps, um, you needed stone to kill all those animals. And so here during this late archaic time period between about 3000 and 1500 years ago, you see a real escalation in the procurement of obsidian. Um, so we're going to work our way northward a little bit and go up into the mountains. And then one of the things I'm always amazed at and that I like to talk about is, is how, you know, even the most remote areas, places where you would never think that anybody had ever been before, uh, we find a tremendous amount of evidence for archaeology. And this is a picture of an important archaeologist um, who has uh, collaborations with Montana Uni State University, Co University of Colorado, uh, does a lot of archaeology in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and his research, Craigley, is his name, is based at ice patches. Maybe uh, in the global warming climate, you have a lot of these ice patches, similar to glaciers, uh, in the sense that they're a permanent part of these usually high elevation north facing slopes, where you get permanent collections of snow that just doesn't melt off over the course of the year. Now, animals love those in the summertime. They can roll around in them to stay cool. They can use it as a source of water. Um, the, the snow also keeps bugs off of them and that sort of thing. It's just nice and cool. And so at all these high elevation ice packs, there's animals. And so guess what? Native Americans were going up there to hunt those animals. Uh, and so Craig and his colleagues, and I've done this a little bit, and Beth Horton's done this, and other Yellowstone archaeologists in the past, like Stefan Peterson, Ann Johnson, Elaine Hale, have all been participating in this high elevation archaeology at these ice patches because guess what? There's lots of artifacts falling out of the melting ice patches. So this is an illustration of the type of activity that would have occurred. Eric Carlson's a really important archaeologist uh, and artist here in Missoula, uh, based, based here and uh, did the illustrations for the Before Yellowstone book, my, another one of my books, Montana Before History, um, as well as a, a couple other really great books on Montana archaeology as well that are out there. Uh, and so a uh, really important player in terms of disseminating really great illustrations and images, recreating some of these great historical events of, of Native Americans in places like Yellowstone. So this is a reimagining of that last photo where artifacts were found around the uh, edge of an ice patch, imagining a group of Native American hunters with their bows and arrows. So that puts it in the last 1500 years or so, hunting a herd of bighorn sheep that were just hanging out at an ice patch <clears throat> at 10, 11,000 feet within Yellowstone National Park. So this is the oldest artifact ever found at a high elevation ice patch anywhere in the world. It's, it was found by uh, Craig Lee and his team in the Absorca Mountains. So it's not, this isn't, obviously I'm talking more specifically about the Gallatins on our tour, but all the mountains around Yellowstone have ice patches and there's been a tremendous amount of work by Craig Lee and his colleagues that I've mentioned here, uh, trying to look for artifacts in these ice patches. And Craig and his colleagues found this 9,000, about a 9,500 year old atlatl dart shaft that was used to hunt animals. Um, you can't really see it that well, but in the upper right on the edge of it, there's three parallel lines that are uh, engraved into that atlatl dart shaft, which are ownership marks um, for the individual that hunted with this atlatl. And obviously they weren't able to retrieve it. It probably got lost in the snow when they were hunting, um, but the three linear striations show me every time I, I think about it, that this hunter was sponsored by Adidas. That's a joke. Uh, mountains, mountain landscapes were used for um, multiple tribes for religious purposes. Uh, they would go up there to fast, to have, uh, to deprive themselves of water, of food for, for days on end in order to facilitate contact with spirits for healing, just to become at peace um, and to uh, just to have visionary sorts of experiences. The Shoshone did it, Blackfeet did it. Uh, the crow did it uh, even within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And so the mountains are important for subsistence, for hunting and gathering, but they play an important role in the spiritual lives of Native Americans uh, as well. And finally, the last thing I'll say about mountains is that um, these days, white bark pine have been in the media because the forests are getting decimated by the 
the pine beetles. And so the pine beetles are decimating these ancient stands of white bark pine trees. And um, uh, in the in past years, when the pine, white bark pine trees were, were more plentiful, were more abundant in terms of their nuts, uh, they would generate thousands of nuts and Native Americans would go, venture into the mountains to collect those as an important dietary feature in the fall. So they'd collect the nuts and they'd use them uh, throughout the fall and winter as an important food source. And so those usually occur at elevations eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 feet. And so this is a, a photograph of a white bark pine tree stand in the, in the Gallatin Mountains. And so Native Americans would have been up in those uh, areas in, in the late summer to fall to collect the white bark pine nuts uh, for their food. So in association with those locations of white bark pine procurement uh, along places like this picture, which is the Skyrim Trail, uh, we find evidence of, of Native American archaeological sites. So it's not just restricted to the Yellowstone Valley or the Gardner Valley or, or Yellowstone Lake. The archaeology that we find associated with Native Americans extends back as long as 11,000 years uh, into every nook and cranny of Yellowstone National Park. Um, moving northward on our tour of Yellowstone, this is uh, overlooking the Yellowstone River Valley down into the Gardner Basin. You can see the Devil's Slide there uh, in the background. Um, this was a photograph taken in that landscape. I wanted to use this as the cover of the Before Yellowstone book. So I had mocked up this cover um, and I, pref I prefer this cover over the one that actually was published. At the end of this talk, I'll give you another cover that I prefer even more than this one. Um, and so there's some important archeological sites in the Gardner Basin. You know, I'll just speak in general about the Yellowstone River Valley as an important place for uh, Native Americans. There's just a tremendous amount of archeological sites throughout the, the Yellowstone River Valley. And I've, I've shown this picture uh, dozens of times on these uh, talks. Uh, and this shows uh, one of those important archeological sites there along, along the Yellowstone River Valley, low stone circle sites, um, habitation sites, places where Native American lived. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, as a really important uh, river, the Yellowstone was very actively used by Native Americans. Uh, in fact, one of the two locations where we have found Clovis points was in the Yellowstone River Valley. So we found a Clovis point made of a material called red porcelainite um, along the Yellowstone River Valley in Yellowstone. So a Clovis point, for those of you that don't know, dates to 11,000 years ago. And we found two of them in Yellowstone. I'll show you another one in a minute. Um, another really cool aspect of the archaeology in the Gardner Basin um, is, was, was the fact that even before Gardner was established as the Northern Pacific Railroad stop, we had the town of Cinnabar. Cinnabar was in existence as the original train stop. Uh, it was where the Northern Pacific stopped uh, before it was extended further to the south to Gardner. And that town is now abandoned. There's nothing out there now, but some of our early archaeology in 2007 and 2008 was focused on relocating that original town of Cinnabar, and that was really fun. Um, so once we get into the places like we're moving up around again clockwise throughout the uh, Yellowstone National Park, um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the archaeology of the Lamar River Valley. I think I go there to see animals and see the beautiful wildlife as well as you probably do. It's one of the best places to see wolves. Um, so this this section of the talk, I just show some, show some great pictures of animals that I've taken <laughs> in, the, in the Lamar River Valley. So if you're ever wondering where to go to see animals, there's the big bison herd. There's always some wolf dens in the Lamar River Valley. And it's really a great place to go to see bighorn sheep over toward Cook City. Uh, even though mountain goats aren't native to Yellowstone National Park, there's mountain goats up in the steep hillsides above the valley in that part of the park. So it's if you're wondering if there's one place to go, to see animals in, in Yellowstone National Park, I always tell people to go to uh, the Lamar River Valley. So this next sequence of slides is a little bit of a break from the archeology span to see the wonderful uh, panoramic, beautiful scenery of, of the Lamar River Valley. And we did, we have done archaeology in that area, but I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, then moving southward from the Lamar River Valley down to Yellowstone Lake. So at Yellowstone Lake, again, I, I think I mentioned this at the beginning of this talk, but there's been a tremendous amount of archaeology at Yellowstone Lake uh, over about a four-year period around 2010. 
University of Montana, led by my teams, did a lot of that. Um, before that, we had Brian Reeves and his teams out of um, Calgary uh, doing a lot of that work. Uh, and Ann Johnson uh, and Lane Hale, a, a lot of Yellowstone Park archaeologists have done work at Yellowstone Lake. And so it's, it's been a real big focus simply because there's a lot of archaeology, a lot of evidence that Native Americans visited uh, North America's largest high elevation lake uh, for thousands of years. And so this is the second place where we found a Clovis point dating to 11,000 years. So we know that somebody 11,000 years ago uh, was, was at Yellowstone Lake. Uh, again, I showed this picture already, but we, I thoroughly enjoyed those days when we were floating around Yellowstone on our boats, even though sometimes we almost sunk them. Um, so lots of different artifacts in Yellowstone. So on the far right, you're gonna see an artifact that we did not find. That is a plastic cast of one of the obsidian Clovis points from the really famous Anzic site. Now, I know the Gateway Museum had a whole series on Anzic, which is an archeological site north of Livingston that dates to about 11,000 years old. And it has a two-year-old infant associated with a bunch of artifacts. One of those artifacts is represented by that artifact on the right. So we didn't find anything that cool, right? So we found a Clovis point, but it's just down to the left. We found the base of a Clovis point made from Teton Pass obsidian. So that's a type of obsidian found around Jackson Hole. So that tells me that the individual, that Clovis person 11,000 years ago, traveled from the Jackson Hole area, probably following the Snake River up into uh, the Two Ocean area, venturing eventually into uh, the Yellowstone Lake area. That person carrying that obsidian Clovis point could have been the first, very first person to actually see Yellowstone Lake. And that, that's an, kind of an amazing thing. Um, we found a lot of other artifacts at archeological sites at Yellowstone Lake. And one of the interesting things is that um, even though bone doesn't preserve well, due to the acidic soils at Yellowstone, we can find the preservation of proteins on stone tools used to kill and butcher animals. And so these are some of the artifacts that we found in this uh, photograph that show evidence of all kinds of different animals that have been killed and or butchered by Yellowstone Native Americans using of these varieties of uh, stone tools. And so hopefully you'll take a look at that and you'll see that you know, things like deer and bison were commonly killed. Um, dogs might have been killed and eaten as well. That's probably wouldn't have been that uncommon, but I like to, I also think it's just as likely that those dogs urinated on these artifacts because they were always hanging out in camp. Native American hunter-gatherers in Yellowstone would have had dogs running around uh, help, helping as beasts of burden, helping in hunts and that sort of thing. And so there would have always been dogs hanging out in camp. So I think it's just as likely that a dog positive protein on a stone tool actually is telling me that a dog was just hanging out in camp. <laughs> Not necessarily that a dog was eaten, although it, it may have happened. Um, but I think hopefully one of the animals that you're seeing pop up as you look at those protein residues on these stone tools is bear. And so I think that Native Americans were fairly actively hunting bear in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. I can't distinguish grizzly from bear when we do the protein analysis, Grizz, uh, grizzly from black bear when we do the protein analysis, but um, probably both were being hunted. And in all likelihood, they were being hunted during the period in which they're waking up from hibernation, which would be about now. You know, I think maybe a couple of weeks ago was the first bear sighting uh, of the spring. And as we start to get warmer and warmer, you'll start to see more and more bears wake up from hibernation. Hunter gatherers throughout the Northern Hemisphere across the world hunt bears at that time. That just seems to be a really common type. So I think Native Americans were probably starting their seasonal cycle, moving up into Yellowstone, uh, in the very, very early spring, again, just right around this time of year, um, to look for the bear, bears in their dens and hunt them as they're sort of groggy and coming up out of, out of hibernation. And so that's, I think, a good reason why we find bear protein on lots of stone tools, especially at high elevation places like Yellowstone Lake, where bears are known to hibernate. Um, one of the most important archaeological sites in Yellowstone is called Osprey Beach. This is a 9,300-year-old archaeological site associated with a group called the Cody Culture. Uh, Ann Johnson and her group from Yellowstone, along with Brian Reeves from Calgary, did the archaeology at, at a very important site called Osprey Beach, which is, in, which is in the West Thumb. So that's one of the older sites in Yellowstone. So based on the two Clovis points that we found in Yellowstone, we know that the first Native Americans arrived about 11,000 years ago to Yellowstone. Um, but the use of Yellowstone really escalated around 9,500 years ago or so with this Cody culture 
uh, which really loved uh, Yellowstone Lake in particular. So we find a lot of archeological sites um, starting about 9,500 years ago and then continuing onward for there. Native Americans lived in Yellowstone for the last 11,000 years, but with a lot more intensity after 9,500 years. Um, lots of different places that we've excavated uh, in, in Yellowstone National Park. So this is another one near the headwaters of the Yellowstone River as it flows out of, of Yellowstone Lake where there's a lot of archeology span as well. All right, so moving, we're kind of enclosing our circle here and I'll stop with these next few slides talking about more modern contemporary use of Yellowstone by Native American peoples. And so the areas in sort of the far Western area of the park um, mark the locations where um, Native Americans have lived for thousands of years again, but really important, more importantly than that, in terms of our understanding of the human use of Yellowstone is that that's the year that um, Chief Joseph and the Nez Perce moved through Yellowstone, escaping their Native American reservation in Idaho, uh, moving up through the Missoula Valley where I am right now, down the Bitterroot Valley, down into Yellowstone, uh, around West Yellowstone, and then into along the Madison River, into the thermal areas um, ar around the, the Firehole River. So this, this is a photograph of a hot spring along the Firehole River. This is an area that the Nez Perce would have cut through in 1877. They had encounters with uh, tourists, and so the Wa Office of the Wyoming State Archaeologist has done a lot of archaeological work associated with following the Nez Perce through Yellowstone in 1877. Dan Akins, the main archaeologist that did all that work, and they've identified uh, archaeological sites associated with those 1877 Chief Joseph and 700 uh, Nez Perce people um, moving through the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, trying to get up to a sitting bull at his camp in Saskatchewan um, in that summer of 1877. And so that's been an important piece of the archaeology that I just wanted to mention. Uh, and just gives you a bit of more recent Native American history in the sense that, you know, think about it. The park was established in 1872. And so tourists were there watching 700 Nez Perce move through Yellowstone. Three of those tourists were killed and many more, uh, a couple more were injured. Uh, can you imagine being a tourist? Uh, one of a, only a handful at that time, of course, these days we have thousands every day. At that time, you know, it's just a handful of tourists coming in and out of the park to look at the beautiful uh, natural beauty of the park. Um, Imagine being those first tourists encountering Chief Joseph with 700 fellow Nez Perce, 2,000 horses moving through uh, the Greater Yellowstone, uh, Yellowstone National Park. It would have been uh, quite a sight and, and ended up not too, not too great for some of those tourists uh, as, the, as the Nez Perce were trying to escape. So the reason they were moving so quickly through Yellowstone, they're only there probably a few days, is that the U.S. Cavalry was chasing them on that journey. They wanted to capture them and, and eventually did capture them. So this is a map showing you sort of more of an overview, um, showing where the Chief Joseph and the Nez Perce trip started in 1877 over in Idaho in the area where they wanted to establish the reservation. Uh, they worked their way again down through Missoula into Yellowstone National Park and ended up at the Bear Paw Battlefield in uh, um, some very cold days in uh, central Montana uh, in the fall of 1877. And again, they were trying to reach Sitting Bull. So, uh, and the reason the US Cavalry was so persistent in chasing down Chief Joseph is because they didn't want him to reach Sitting Bull. Sitting Bull had just defeated Custer the year before at um, a Little Bighorn. So it was really important uh, military objective for the U.S. Cavalry to, to stop the Nez Perce and to not allow them to get up to Sitting Bull. However, I don't know, this isn't really all that well known in the history of the Nez Perce, but a pretty substantial portion of that Nez Perce group, even though Chief Joseph was captured and many of Chief Joseph's followers were captured, uh, Many other Nez Perce actually did flee and escape and did reach um, Saskatchewan to join Sitting Bull's group. So I think most people think, oh, the Nez Perce were stopped at the Bear Paw, Bear Paw uh, battlefield. But the fact is that at least a third or, uh, of those uh, Nez Perce in, in that group did escape and, and made it northward in, into Saskatchewan, even though the most famous of those, Chief Joseph and many of his followers were captured and, and uh, never set foot on their in their homelands again. They were brought down to Oklahoma, um, put on reservations there, and eventually Chief Joseph and many of his group were allowed to return to Washington State, and Chief Joseph himself is buried up on the Colville Reservation in central Washington. 
And so another thing I think that's really interesting to add to this story is that the Crow Reservation in the 1870s, uh, up until 1868, I'll show you another map that shows that a little better, but up until 1868, uh, the Crow Reservation encompassed the eastern third of Yellowstone National Park. By the time the Nez Perce came through, this wasn't the boundary. The boundary had pushed all the way up to the Montana border. But, um, but you know, one of the reasons that Chief Joseph and the Nez Perce were going that way is because they were trying to solidify aid, solidify help from the Crow. Um, in fact, the Crow did not help them. The Crow helped the US Cavalry and, and stole horses from the Nez Perce on that journey. So that really acted counter to what the Nez Perce wanted in that, in that journey. But that was one of the reasons they decided to go that, that route. Um, and so if you were standing at, at, at uh, the Canyon Overlook, looking at the beautiful Yellowstone River Falls uh, from 1851 to 1868, that was part of the original Fort Laramie Crow Reservation boundary. So the Eastern third of Yellowstone was part of the Crow Reservation up until just before Yellowstone National Park was established. Probably not a coincidence that that boundary was changed in 1868 with the second Fort Laramie Treaty, moving that treaty northward up into, completely up into Montana, so all the way up out of Wyoming. So starting in 1868, um, between 1868 and 1882, um, the Crow Reservation boundary was even then just north of, of the boundary of, of what became Yellowstone National Park. 150, 150 years ago. And I like to add that to this story because I don't think it's, it's not well advertised by Yellowstone in any of the literature and any sort of roadside displays. Um, it, it's something that it was sort of surprising for me when I was getting into the research for the Before Yellowstone book that, that the Crow Reservation actually did encompass um, the entire Eastern third of Yellowstone just until really just before the park was established. So just an interesting side bit of history there about Native American reservation boundaries that kept getting constricted and constricted as, as European Americans started to live in higher populations in, in the West. And so this is the cover of, this is the end of the talk, and this is the last thing I wanted to, to show you is that, you know, one of the things I try to do in my research and that the cultural resources staff at Yellowstone tries to do, I think, and what they do is bring people to Yellowstone, bring Native American history, um, and, and all kinds of European American history uh, in, into the park to disseminate that information to Yellowstone. So I was, it was disappointing when I asked Eric Carlson to illustrate the cover of the Before Yellowstone book that came out in 2018. This was what I envisioned as the color, uh, as the cover, this image on the left of, of what I, I said, Eric, think about a, a nice scene of the first people, the first Clovis hunters working up the Firehole Valley into Yellowstone National Park, um, see, being the first people ever to see Old Faithful erupt, wouldn't that have been something? And so he did this illustration and that was gonna be the cover of the book. I sent this cover to the University of Washington Press and they laughed at me, they said, that's not a cover. And so what they did then was use this, this photograph as the cover of the book and disregarded my idea. I really regret allowing them to do that because the whole point of the book and the whole point of a lot of my research has been to bring people into the park. And here we have the cover of my own book, not showing people uh, in, in Yellowstone National Park. So if it ever goes into a reprint, I'm gonna push really hard to get the cover be this, uh, the, the one on the left. And so that's it. Well, thank you, Doug. That was a fascinating program. Um, you know, we had a few questions during the program that we'll, um, we'll uh, have you respond to. I, you've partially responded to some of them, but we'll go ahead and present them and then pick up the new questions. Um, and the first one really had to do with, um, do you work with contemporary um, tribal people in your work? And you somewhat answered that, but I wanted to know if you wanted to expand on that at all. Yeah, the only way I do that is really through is when Yellowstone asked me to collaborate. So last last summer, we had a group of Confederate Salish Kootenai um, tribal students come out and visit one of our archaeological sites. So under those circumstances, where the federal agency in that government to government role has established that line of communication that I'll all participate in tribal consultation. Um, the other way I would do it is, as I do have students on my teams, Native students that are of Native American ethnicity, tribal origin of different tribes. We've had a, a lot come through the University of Montana Department of Anthropology. Many of the tribal historic preservation offices in Montana are staffed by um, students that graduated from the University of Montana. And a few of those folks have, have taken my 
um, and join me on my archaeological projects in Yellowstone. But those are the two, two capacities. And I simply because really I'm acting as a consultant. I don't speak for Yellowstone, right? So I've tried to make that very clear today. I don't, I'm not, a, I don't get, I'm not employed by Yellowstone. That's the government agency. And by all the rules of cultural resource management, the government is Yellowstone National Park communicating directly with the tribal tribal uh, historic preservation offices and those those different tribes that want to be consulted. So I don't do that directly. Yeah. Well, appreciate what you said about students and um, and encouraging students at the very beginning uh, to consider careers in archaeology too. That's something that this we've tried to do through other work at the museum and glad to hear you mention it. So thank you. Okay. Okay, Doug, I've got a question for you also. Uh, and the question is this, doesn't Obsidian Cliff extend beyond the cliff itself for square miles on the surrounding land surface? Yeah, so the, that's, you know, that was one of the things I tried to describe in that bit on the Obsidian Cliff is it's very big. I showed that one picture of the cliff face and that's sort of what we all see when we drive through Yellowstone. Um, but the actual Obsidian Cliff National Historic Landmark in terms of its boundaries ex extend virtually almost halfway to Norris Geyser Basin on the south, mm -hmm. and then for a couple of miles uh, to the east, as, as well as north of that point. And um, I've, estimated, I've estimated based on the geologic distribution of the Obsidian Formation relative to the boundaries of where it's been mapped that there's enough obsidian there to fill something like 3,000 Super Bowls. <laughs> there's just so much obsidian and, and uh, part of it is, yeah, it's not just that one spot, but the entire thing is off limits. So don't just think you can't go up at that location. So don't take my answer to mean, oh, you can go up on these other spots. You can't go up on obsidian cliff anywhere. It is, it, it is illegal, so um, don't go up there. <laughs> Thanks. We appreciate that. There was a question. Um, you had talked about two Clovis Point locations, one being Yellowstone Lake, the Teton Pass Obsidian, and then the other one was the other location, Yellowstone River near Gardner. Uh, we mm -hmm. weren't okay. That was the question. Mm -hmm. And that, that Clovis Point was made of red porcelainite. That comes right. from it's called porcelainite. It's a type of stone that occurs in eastern Montana. In eastern Wyoming, it's associated with the coal seams in those areas. Oh, interesting. Okay. So Thank we can you. tell that that person traveled quite a far, quite far as well. Yeah. Okay. And here's another question. Can Yellowstone archaeological sites and artifacts be assigned to plateau, Great Basin, or plains groups or tribes? I would say only in the last 1500 to 2000 years, once you start to see pottery in particular. So there's a few sites in Yellowstone that have had pottery. There's, there's one at Yellowstone Lake called the First Blood Site. That's one of the few sites in Yellowstone that actually has pottery. Now, the good thing about pottery is that you can, it's an ethnic identifier. So Shoshone made pottery differently than say the Crow, uh, than say the, you know, the ancestral Nez Perce or the, or the Blackfeet. And so it is an ethnic identifier. Uh, and so that particular pottery at the first blood site is was Shoshone pottery. And so you can say that archeological site, it would think it dated to maybe seven, 800, 800 years ago, um, can be linked to the Shoshone. But Outside of that, it's really difficult to associate tribes to specific archaeological sites. We know that the Crow were in there. We know the Shoshone, the Nez Perce, the Blackfeet, Salish, Kootenai, Kiowa even, and, and other groups like the Northern Cheyenne, all were using it in and out of Yellowstone. But unfortunately, they were all using similar types of stone tools. <laughs> so 99% of what we find at archaeological sites in Yellowstone are stone tools. And they all were using the same kinds. One of the things we can do is look at the obsidian types, right? And so what we do is trace the chemical signatures of the different obsidians, and we can get regions of origin. So we can say this, these people came from the north, maybe it's Salish Kootenai, they came from the west, maybe it's Nez Perce, they came from the south, maybe it's, maybe it's Shoshone. Those are the sorts of things we can do 
but it's it's almost impossible to say this site was used by by the crow or this site was used by the Shoshone um, simply because the material culture we're finding doesn't allow us to interpret that. The next question uh, is from one of our board members, and you'll be able to, by the way, for everyone who's submitting questions, um, Doug will be able to see the questions and 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 uh, you know note you know your comments. But I'm going to go ahead and read this one. Uh, he says, "Hi, Doug. Wow, <laughs> thank you, and thanks for all of your work sharing it with us." Uh, in the general public. My question recently, David Attenborough criticized those who discourage fossil collecting because doing so itself discourages the curiosity that drives conservation uh, in our youth. And while human artifacts aren't the same in the same category, which organizations, models, personal experiences can you share for us operating a local museum that taps into the human desire to find things and the need to protect those finds? If education truly does result in preservation, how do we keep people excited about the 11,000 plus year human history in our area while still preserving it, respecting it, and better understanding it? So. Um, so I, you know, that's a, I mean, I mean, it's kind of the question of anyone. I would suspect anyone who is interested in in the field of work that you're in, um, you have this natural curiosity. You got into it, um, so that's the question. Yeah, no, my first experience in archaeology was in Mexico. That's how I started started to learn about it, and I picked up stuff. You know, I yeah, it was totally wrong. I shouldn't have done it, but I I, I think I'm a lot. I just didn't know any better, and I think a lot of people. Are like that. And so I would just encourage people to, instead of picking it up, take pictures, <laughs> um, record the locations using a GPS, give that information to the park archaeologists so they know them, um, fill out the archaeological site forms that the State Historic Preservation Offices in Wyoming and Montana and Idaho provide for the different areas of Yellowstone. Um, so you can contribute and, and do a lot to better and, and educate the public on, on the important places without actually taking the artifacts. And, and so any kind of taking of artifacts on federal or tribal lands illegal, it, it just isn't a good thing to do. And it's a fine line, like you said, and like the question asked is, one of my main goals is disseminate information like I do in these talks. I don't, you know, one of the real hard things in that before Yellowstone book was to show great photographs that didn't give away site locations. <laughs> and I was working with the park archaeologists to make sure that that didn't happen. But even then, I think a few of the pictures you could probably figure out where where these locations are if you were really, you know, smart <laughs> and explored them and, and knew Yellowstone really well, you could probably figure it out. And so that's the scariest thing is that somebody would use this information to go in and, and dig holes in these sites. And so uh, the park archaeologists have a much harder time with that, and they've had some serious issues in the last few years. And, you know, I can only assume it's because a lot more information has gotten out there to the public from, from a lot, just a lot more information being out there in the public about the archaeology. And so, yeah, it definitely keeps me away, awake at night. You know, am I giving away a site location? Is, is the park archaeologist going to have to take this person to, to court, you know, and... Um, I certainly that's the last thing I want to happen. But, but the flip side of that is, you know, maybe we need to build more opportunities in Yellowstone and, and disseminate more information. And I think the park is going to be doing that this summer with their 150th anniversary uh, celebrations. They're going to have a, a Native American Heritage Center at Old Faithful. They're going to have a TP, TP uh, Cultural Heritage Center in Gardner at certain points during this 150th anniversary. Um, I've always encouraged to try to build some sort of trail excuse me, up to the top of, Yale, of Obsidian Clip. I always get, they always tell me that's never going to happen, but my argument is if you can build a trail across some of these hot springs, which absolutely lethal to fall in, I think you can probably figure out a way to build one up to the top of Obsidian Cliff so people can actually see these trenches and pits that are up there, because there's hundreds of pits and trenches. Um, and I think it would really tell a wonderful story. But again, it's this, you don't want people to take the obsidian. So it's, it's a really a big problem. And I, I certainly feel the pain of the park archeologists and, and try to do my best to at least inform people about the laws that protect those sites um, and give them other ways to sort of participate um, and, and to add their two cents. And certainly going to the Yellowstone Gateway Museum is a great way to do it. And 
uh, the museum in West well, Yellowstone is another great spot. Cody has the Buffalo Bill. I mean, um, there's just great opportunities to, to learn about um, just right around the, all the different entrances to Yellowstone. We have lots of questions, but it's a great topic. And, you know, it's the idea of perhaps citizen scientists or some way to, in an, in an appropriate way, involve the public in a way that still protects the, the sites is just so important. But we'll keep going with our questions for you. Okay, we have another one. And I'm curious to hear your answer because I too, like this person who asked the question, have been at the top of Avalanche Peak. Um, and he says um, that there is a circular formation of boulders and rocks on the top. I didn't know if you were familiar with it, whether it was Native American related or not. I don't, I don't think I've been to the top of that, that mountain, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was a Native American fasting bed. That's what you're describing is, is the sort of structure that was built. Really, they were building just rock formations to protect them in case the weather got bad. <laughs> You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and so yeah. um, it was just part of the, the ceremony and the ritual of, of praying up at those locations. Now, I will say that some of them have been rebuilt over time. And so there probably are reconstructions of hikers and going people going up there and putting rocks there and building the cairn up and modernizing them. But, um, you know, if, if, that, if that person has some photographs, has a good location on a GPS, uh, again, I would, I would say, email the park archaeologists and you can just search Yellowstone archaeology or Yellowstone cultural resources to get the names and the email addresses of those folks and um, you can send them that information and, and that's really important for them and managing all the different resources that's their job is to manage those resources and, and so um, they, they need to know where those locations are. So the next question is, what can you tell us about the fishing trap on Yellowstone Lake near the marina? And is that really a Native American fish trap? And in your book, it didn't sound like it was a fish was a main staple, the diet of the locals. So, yeah. So you have a photograph of that, or at least you're used to. I haven't been in your museum in a few years, but there used to be a photograph of that um, feature in Yellowstone Lake in the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. It used to be part of a display there. Um, and it's just, there's a, a nice line of rocks out into Yellowstone Lake as you drive down to the West Thumb, I think is where this person is, is talking about. And, you know, we have found those all around the edges of Yellowstone Lake. And they, what I interpret them to be is uh, the remnants of old shorelines that have just melted away and eroded away because of the sh of wave action. And so what that leaves behind is what looks like almost like a rock wall. <laughs> Um, the ones that I've seen aren't locations where people would have built weirs, right? And so the one that I think this person's talking about also isn't a really bad location for a weir. Typically, a weir would be either in a creek or at the mouth of a creek. Um, and even though I think Native Americans might have fished at Yellowstone Lake, I've never found a weir like that. Uh, we've also never found any evidence of um, fishing in terms of artifacts, tools for fishing, um, we've never found any fish proteins or fish bones. Um, and so, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to think that the Shoshone who used Yellowstone Lake a lot fished there. But the flip side of that is that those types of fishing artifacts sometimes don't last over time very well. Um, and so fish hooks, for example, are made of bone or shell. The Yellowstone soils don't preserve those very well. The fish bone themselves are really tiny. Those also would not preserve very well. Um, uh, if, if they were building weirs, again, I think they would be in creeks or in at the mouths of creeks. Every spring, those are gonna get blown out by water runoff and be pretty hard to find. And so while there's very little to almost no archeological evidence to say that Native Americans fished at Yellowstone Lake, if you had a time travel machine, the if you went back to Yellowstone Lake, I almost guarantee that you'd see somebody fishing. <laughs> we just we just don't have the archaeology. The archaeology is it's invisible to the archaeologists right now. So. Thank you. Another question: Did the natives live in Yellowstone Park for any length of time, or did they just travel through? And do you know of any certain ceremonies that were performed there? Um. 
So yeah, I mean, I think most of the use of Yellowstone by the various Native American tribes was seasonal, but you probably had some bands of say the Shoshone and the Crow that operated in, in Yellowstone for a lot of that year. And so again, you have thermal features in Yellowstone, which would have been attractive places to hunt. They've all, archeologists have often speculated about hunting at thermal features. Um, we found a really cool archeological site last summer, which was a animal kill site near a thermal feature. Um, and so those would have been places in the lower elevations of Yellowstone where people could have lived year round, you know, um, and, and at least near there that, of course, the animals would have been there. Maybe they wouldn't want to have camped right at the locations where the animals would have wanted to be. But um, so in general, I think it was seasonal use, probably in warmer months, but you probably had some hunter gatherer groups using Yellowstone more often than not. Um, so you could say it was permanent, as much as permanent hunter-gatherers can be who were traveling around all the time, right? Um, I don't know, if, well, I mean, there's lots of Kiowa have an origin story at one of the hot springs down in the Hayden Valley. So there is a known Kiowa origin story associated with one of the hot springs in the Yellowstone River Valley, north of Yellowstone Lake. Um, that doesn't answer your question about ceremonies. We do know through interviews with Crow that some of those individuals that were going to fast did so at hot springs and thermal features. Um, and those were known as ceremonial spaces as well. But I don't know of any specific ceremonies per se, other than if you think about fasting and vision questing as ceremonies. Uh, I'm not exactly what sure, sure, but certainly rituals to facilitate uh, spiritual and religious purposes. Um, the next question is about um, Native American names of features within the park, Yellowstone peaks, thermal features, rivers. Are you aware of any or do you know of any? Well, I know there was that recent proposal in the news last year. I'm not involved with it at all but the Yellowstone Cultural Resource staff probably are, but there was a proposal from some of the Native American groups to rename the Hayden Valley, to remove Hayden's name um, as, as a somewhat notorious figure in Native American history in the region, uh, as well as, God, I forget the other one. Um, there was another place name, a, a mountain that uh, some Native American tribal groups wanted to rename. And I don't know the status of that. And, off the top of my head, I can't think of any place names that I've traveled through in Yellowstone that are Native American. Now, one of the cool things that happened in Western Montana when they rebuilt the highway up from say Missoula up to um, Flathead Lake is they put up a lot of signage about Native American history. So I wouldn't be surprised if Yellowstone did that sometime in the future is to incorporate Native American terminology to some of the important places in Yellowstone, because they did have names for, say, Obsidian Cliff, right. they had names for Yellowstone Lake, you know, all the, all the places that are important to us today as tourists <laughs> um, were important to Native American people as well, and so they had their own, own names for them, and I'd, I'd say that you could probably, I could, I don't know that that's happening, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, let's see the next question. We have a handful more, it looks like. They keep coming in. People are very, very interested. Um, this, one is also, <laughs> um, this one is also um, about obsidian. Um, she says, you emphasize the importance of obsidian. Did you find lots of other types of stone used for tools in the park? Yeah, so obsidian is the most common one, but uh, there's a lot of different types of stone. Um, at Yellowstone Lake, there's a material that's called orthoquartzite that occurs in naturally in big, massive boulders um, around some of the spots at Yellowstone Lake. So that was fun. It's a really pretty kind of purplish, pinkish rock that Native Americans used. We found a couple of quarries of that. Um, chert is a really common one. Uh, when we were up, excuse me, so chert is just a silicified uh, stone that occurs in limestone formations. There's also a type of chert that, that was formed in a basalt formation not too far away from, from Mammoth. Uh, Native Americans were using that a lot in the northern part of the park. 
one of the coolest areas where we found a lot of um, different types of stone other than obsidian were some of those petrified forests, um, which are pretty common in the higher, higher elevations in different parts of Yellowstone. And so Native Americans were collecting that and making stone tools out of it. And it's really beautiful to see a projectile point or oh, arrowhead wow. made out of that, yeah. that petrified wood because you can still see the grain of the old wood. Right. It's really pretty. Neat. Yeah. Um, the next question is, have you asked any tribes for help in identifying stone tools? Um, I've, I've not incorporated Native American people into my stone tool identification personally, but it, it's something that's been done. Other stone tool analysts have, have certainly done that. Um, okay. Uh, and then a question about the Clovis points that were found uh, in the park. Are they at the University of Montana or at the Yellowstone Heritage Center? So uh, in general, completely all the artifacts that we find, we, we uh, bring them back to the University of Montana. And then we analyze them. We write up our reports. We do our research. And then within a year or two, um, they're carefully labeled and placed within um, curation quality bags and, and other sorts of storage boxes and, and things and given to the Gardner Heritage and Research Center. So those two Clovis points, as, as far as I know, are in Gardner. Here's another fishing related question. How do you interpret the granite net weight found at the main creek site? Would it not have been used for fishing? Yeah, so, well, wait a second. You're, you're, <laughs> you're insinuating that question asker that Nate, we haven't found any Native American fishing evidence anywhere in the park. The question was about Yellowstone Lake, right? Uh, yeah. So, yes, there have been artifacts associated with fishing at Yellowstone River sites. The, one of them is that Malin Creek site. I'm wondering who asked that question. Um, <laughs> there also have been fish bones and fishing artifacts at Mummy Cave. So that's just east of the park. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, it gets into a deeper question of when fish actually got to Yellowstone Lake, right? That would not have been an easy journey. And so it's, it's, I'm not sure we even know that answer to that question. I've asked park fishery biologists if they know uh, through DNA analysis, we, we know that the fish, the, the trout that live in Yellowstone Lake, the native trout, got there following the Snake River, right? So they followed the Snake River up to the Two Ocean Plateau, laid some eggs, some of those fish went into the Yellowstone River. That's, we don't know when that happened. <laughs> so the reason we might not find a lot of fishing evidence at Yellowstone Lake is because that might've been somewhat recently. We just don't know. Oh, uh, wow. But yeah. what we do know that fish were all through the Shoshone River, the Yellowstone River, and there, we also know that people were fishing in the Yellowstone River, but you know as well as I do that there's no way that fish are going to make it up the Yellowstone River, right? Except if people brought them up above the falls, which right. is possible. They, that could have happened. What I mean is Native Americans <laughs> putting them in baskets and pulling them up around. Now that's possible. Um, but there's, yeah, obviously no, there's no way they're going to get up those waterfalls in the Yellowstone River. <laughs> uh, so... Um, but so to answer that, I think they were implying that Native Americans weren't fishing anywhere in Yellowstone, but they were. They, what we what were uncertain about is Yellowstone Lake. I think it's, you know, they were fishing along the Madison River. They were fishing along the, the Yellowstone and uh, into the Snake, I'm sure. So I was talking about Yellowstone Lake. <laughs> Okay, here's another question, uh, Doug. You're being a good sport answering all these questions. Um, he says that he was at another presentation at the Yellowstone Gateway Museum years ago uh, where the presenter talked about stone walls or a fence that would be used to guide game to waiting hunters. And he's referencing one near Leduc Hot Springs. Have you found any in Yellowstone? Yes, yeah, not well. We haven't. I wouldn't say we found walls, but what we have found are cairns, rock mm -hmm. piles that were used probably with um, fencing that Native American hunter gatherers would have traveled around with them. And so, archaeologists have actually found the 
the uh, fences, they were made out of like juniper fibers and sagebrush fibers um, and other textiles and made into these big fences that they were then stretched in strategic landscapes. And the cairns, the rock piles facilitated that. The, one of the cooler ones that I found was up at one of those ice patches um, up at about 10,000 feet up near a high ridge. And they were using the edge of the ice patch, the snow patch is one of the channeling features. Oh, wow. And then built the fence up along a series of cairns to drive animals up to the top of the ridge where there was sort of this remnants of what you could almost interpret to be a, a trap sort of feature. And so absolutely Native American wow. hunter-gatherers were ingenious in knowing how animals behaved and how to push them in the directions they wanted not just to kill bison. So I think we're, we all know that bison were killed at those bison jumps and hundreds and thousands of animals, but there's Native American traps that were used to lure bighorn sheep and pronghorn antelope and elk um, all through the Rocky Mountains, including Yellowstone, so yeah. So the next two are just one word, um, two different people. And I think that they, ref I'm guessing they refer to the question of what other uh, white names in Yellowstone National Park would tribes like to remove or replace? And, I, and they mentioned Sheridan and Mount Doan. Um, and I, I assume from you, from our, our commenters, sense. yeah, that those are, yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yep. Yeah, I mean, Sheridan um, was the leader of the group that was chasing a lot. They were, he was in, instrumental in those, uh, the Native American Wars of the 1870s. Yeah, yeah, those were. Um, Tough, tough times. Um, That's crazy. So, it's crazy to think about how Yellowstone was just lumped, dropped in the middle of, of these Native American <laughs> reservations and, and just wars going on around it. It was it was pretty crazily aggressive by the U.S. government yeah, to yeah. do it, you know? Yeah. Um. I think we've got one more there. So then uh, the next question is, are any Native American um, evidence found around Grasshopper Glacier, which is east of the park? I don't know. You know, um, Craig Lee, contact Craig Lee. He might be able to give away that information. He, he might not do it, but, um, but he's he is, Craig Lee is the main ice patch archeologist and he has mapped out all these places <laughs> and knows them by the, like the back of his hand. It's his life has been dedicated to that sort of research. So he, he would know the answer to that. I have a quick question too. I'm just gonna interject. When you showed the atlatl shaft from the Absorcas, I was just really surprised. I mean, is it actually, does it still have the qualities of wood being over 9,000 years old or is it more like petrified wood? I've never seen it in person, but the pictures like I just, that I showed you, it, it looks pretty fragile. Um, I think it's just sort of weathering and falling apart a little bit. Wow. And That's it would have been straight. <laughs> Good point, yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't throw really well otherwise. No. And here's um, perhaps one last question. I guess, well, we've got a couple here. Um, and then we might wrap it up. Um, he says, you mentioned that there was no fighting over Obsidian Cliff, but I've seen others publish that it appears that different groups set up turf on the various locations of Yellowstone Lake with toolage based on stone sources that were divergent, with some suggesting that these locations would have been protected as a territorial resource. Is there any archeological evidence of territorial positioning or defending by different ancient social groups? Not from a defensive perspective. I mean, Yellowstone Lake is similar to Obsidian Cliff in that it's so big. I mean, it's 20 miles long by 15 miles wide. And so what I've seen in my research, which I think he might be alluding, this person, he or she might be alluding to, is that um, we can see by the obsidian types and the other stone types that Native Americans were coming from different directions to Yellowstone Lake. Um, I think that's probably also true from Obsidian Cliff. Now, I hope that, that they didn't take that to mean that they were defending those positions. <laughs> That's just the convenient place at the lake that they happen to get to based on proximity to where they usually live, right? So mm -hmm. I, I don't think I've ever implied that there was territorial defense of those positions 
I've not ever read anywhere that anybody implied that, but I could see how maybe even my own research could have been interpreted that way in the sense that, yeah, we definitely know that different tribes, diff people of different Native American ethnicities were going to places like Yellowstone Lake and Obsidian Cliff um, and setting up shop in different parts of it, but it, it wasn't to say this is ours necessarily. Um, I'm sure they were trading with the other people that were there from other, other tribes. Um, I've never found any evidence of violent conflict between, between tribes in Yellowstone. Now, that's not true of other places outside of Yellowstone because there have been skeletal remains um, and other evidence of, of traumatic injury between Native American tribes before European Americans arrived. So for example, in the Missouri River Valley, there's plenty of evidence that within the last, about a thousand years ago or so, Native Americans were fighting each other. Um, and, and in intertribal sorts of things. Now, I can't say for certain that that didn't happen at places like Obsidian Cliff and Yellowstone Lake. We just have no, absolutely no evidence that it did. Um, Another quick question that I had, you, you mentioned that 2000 years ago that um, bison hunting was really escalating. Was it because of technology or was it because of bison populations? I mean, why then? Yeah, so I'd say maybe starting three or 4,000 years ago, you start to see a real escalation in the bison populations. So, you know, when you watch a movie like Dances with Wolves, which gives you a really good visual representation of some of the massive buffalo herds that still existed, even into the 1800s in, in the Dakotas and Montana, um, those, those big massive herds of thousands of animals start probably were beginning to form in their in their massiveness uh, during that time period, say 4,000, 3,000 years ago. And human populations looks like we're rising in tandem with that. You know, you can imagine a scenario where you have biomass and animal numbers increasing in, in a way that allows for more humans to, to live and as hunter gatherers. Um, and so that's sort of how it was working was you just start to see an escalation of bison hunting. And now of course, with the escalation of bison hunting and human populations during that time period, we also see an escalation of archeological sites associated with that time period. So starting at that same time, we start to find lots more archeological sites all over Montana, Yellowstone, Wyoming. Um, and so it, it all makes sort of sense uh, when you see the intensity of stone tool procurement and the intensity of Yellowstone, the intensity of use of these obsidian quarries, all, all operating around the Hopewell trade network, but also the intensity wow. in hunting of these big herds of bison. Wow. Well, thank you, Doug. Um, does anyone have a burning question? This is your last chance. Uh, we've had lots of great questions and wonderful answers this evening. I'm sure we could talk for hours. It's all really fascinating. Thank you so much for giving us um, more than an, an hour and a half. Um, yeah, just, you're welcome. Any anytime. I, I love it. So anytime great. I can talk about Yellowstone is a good day for me. Well, thank you so much, Doug. And until next week, uh, good night, everybody, and thanks again. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.